inside my head. I try to turn it down, but I can't quite drown it out. I'm tortured every day. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. You're listening to Society Bites Radio, and I'm your host, Dr. Richard Himmer. And I'm Sherry Himmer, and this is Authentically You, social interaction for the mind and soul. For the next 25 minutes, we talk about healing and growth from the inside out. Remember, you are 100% responsible for your happiness, joy, and well-being. We're picking up from what we talked about last time with this text that I got from a client asking me. So I want to bring uh, context to it. Um, she, or the client writes, don't know how to answer this. Sooner or later, and this is coming from writings that I have, sooner or later you realize that no one cares. That's what I wrote about the fact that we're, we live in a world where there's so much going on, we're so busy, and you said it really eloquently last time, Sherry. It isn't that no one really cares about us. It's, it's that they're so overwhelmed, distracted by their own life events. Right. So the question is, why on earth would I waste my time with people whom I don't care about and who don't care about me? So that's not unusual. I've got this question before, and this stems back from the addiction recovery years when I was explaining that um, the rules of engagement are, are set up, and this is how I learned them. When I observed people's conversations for years, I just – sit outside like in church in the hallways or business functions or any social event. I just sit and watch people and I'd observe, especially if there were three or four of them sitting around talking, I just kind of was a wallflower and I realized nobody's listening to anybody else. Right. Nobody cares about what anyone else is saying. They're so busy thinking about their question or how it applies to them. There's a lack of interest in anyone except in their own self. So it wasn't a function of that you're a lousy person or people are lousy people. It's that the reality is people don't care about you till they know you care about them. That's the law of reciprocity. So let's go back a little bit. We've said many times we are hardwired to connect. At birth, it is by design that we attach and accept our community, mom, dad, parents. As adults, we don't go back to mom, dad, parents. And as a general rule, especially in today's society, most people didn't attach to mom and dad. There's an abandonment issue. And as mentioned also, we now know there's conclusive research that if you're abandoned in utero, if you have trauma in utero, that's direct causation to cancer. We are seeing that in our friends' lives yeah. as we speak. Yeah. And so the idea is this drive to connect is at the root cause of most anxiety and depression that I, I witness, that I observe. And I get, at least I feel I get a larger dose than the average bear, given what I do for a living. So the question itself is collusionary because we're hardwired to connect. And when we don't connect, we get sick, literally, mentally, emotionally, and physically, we get sick. Well said. And... And yet, if we're to say the question that your client posed, well, why waste my time if nobody cares about me? So what's, so what's the, it's like we're back to that law of reciprocity, but there's also this idea of expectations. So I need to go connect and have no expectation that anybody will give a hoot about me. So Albert Einstein, the most important decision we make is whether we believe we believe we live in a friendly or hostile universe. Let me tell you why that means something to me. Some segments ago, months ago, we talked about the coddling of the American mind mm -hmm. and the three great myths perpetrated right now by the 20 to 40 year old group, for lack of a better descriptor, the, the millennials, who grow up in an environment of what are called snowplow parents, heretofore referred to as helicopter parents. A snowplow parent is a helicopter parent on steroids, and a helicopter parent is already maladaptive. So a snowplow parent means the child is has no connection to mom and dad, doesn't learn how to solve, doesn't learn how to get back up, doesn't learn how to process through, has been taught that pain is bad, well, that, therefore that, they move into suffering. <clears throat> um, and you were going to say? I was just going to say that they've plowed away all obstacles for that child, right. so they've never had challenges. And as a result, they've created a habitat, an environment, 
that their three myths are going on, along with a couple other harmful belief structures. Myth number one, it's a us versus them. Myth number two, emotional reasoning. Myth number three, people are fragile, including themselves. Yeah, they've been so, told they're fragile because I, I've I can't been, do this. Oh, it's too hard. I, my parents took all the obstacles out of me. Right. I, had, I had a conversation with um, a 25-year-old this week, and and she was in the room while I'm talking to my best friend who's in the hospital. And um, we're just commenting about why is it that this age group and especially women, we, our, our for whatever reason with, it with, seems with, that way yeah. with women yeah. are struggling with things that we we're like. But when we were that age, and we were doing this myopic retrospection on, um, but when we were this age, this is the things that we were doing, and we could not possibly ask our husbands to stay home from work if we were sick with kids. Interesting. And so we were. Post it to the 25 year old and go like, what is the difference? She goes, we've never had anything hard. She goes, I feel it. I've never had to wow. do. My wow. parents made it so easy and they still are making it easy for me. She goes, I don't know how to do hard things. See, the parents move into rescuers. When the kids don't want the parents to rescue, the parents become, they first feel like a victim and then they move into a persecutor. And we've seen that often and and it's not the the counterpart isn't that parents need to go make it hard for their kids my parents just didn't get in the way of life there was an expectation to work and buy things on your own there was an expectation to work and pay for college there was an expectation and it wasn't like it was it was implicit it was not explicit because that's how life is. And somewhere, as our generation of parents have turned into, but kids can't do that, so therefore we need to do it for them. And there's your um, catastrophizing, fortune-telling, mm -hmm. mind-reading. These are cognitive yeah. distortions based upon false narratives. So here's a quote out of my book. Um, we do not help our children by preventing them from falling. One learns how to recover from falling by falling. A skater moves forward by pushing left and right. People who have never experienced falling or failure are off balance. Can I give a really concrete example? Yeah, but I'm gonna, I, I have four more words to read. Okay. Without an awareness of their situation. Okay. Oh, turn. sorry. <laughs> my father, credit to my dad. He loves skiing and he taught us kids to love skiing, but this is how he taught us. He put me on an oversized pair of wooden skis put me on the hill and pushed me over right on dad. He, he barely, he basically pushed me into the snow and then he said, now get up. And I was crying. I was sweating. I was frustrated. I'm like, wait, this looks so fun. This is miserable. I'm freezing. I've got snow down my neck the whole bit. And, I, and when you just said that the whole fall, I'm like, Oh my gosh, my dad, my dad threw me in the snow and said, now get up. <laughs> And I love skiing. I absolutely, yeah, it's my favorite sport. Uh -huh. And um grateful to dad that he made it hard right from the get-go. I'd like he's to like, take, you can't ski if you can't get yourself I'd back like to up. take credit for teaching my nephew, Chris, how to ski. Um, <laughs> but we didn't have to throw him in the, in the snow. He did that all on his own. <laughs> or, or in the Puget Sound. <laughs> oh, that's true, yeah. He just was a disaster waiting to happen. <laughs> yeah, so. Okay, so back to the idea. Um, the entire purpose behind life is so we can learn to connect, so we could feel this happiness, joy, and well-being. The ability to do that is contingent upon our abilities to know who we ourselves are. And if we're telling ourselves stories that aren't true, what I call a shadow, then we're going to behave according to that. And our mindset, no, just notice the energy. So I'm going to read it again and just pay attention to the energy. Um, I, the, this person's reading sooner or later, you realize that no one cares. Then the question comes, why on earth would I waste my time with people whom I don't care about and who don't care about me? Because the real story is who don't care about me because she or he or they or we are so concerned that others reciprocate first, that others solve our problem because we've somehow got in this mindset 
that this is going to be taking care of us and that it's others' responsibility to make us happy. Yeah. But what happens if they're just as busy trying to figure out their own problems and they're moving forward? The greatest, the greatest gift you can give others and yourself is in the service. And my argument's always been, I think helping people move or helping them build stuff or helping them baking some food or whatever, I think that's nice. And that's that me or that service do mentality that many religion and religious organizations do. But what I rarely see done is people teaching others how to give the greatest gift in life. And that's 15 minutes of undivided, neutral time with someone where that person can just talk about themselves and talk about life, knowing they won't be judged. What a wonderful gift that would be. The question here borders on that gift. That's exactly how you get out of the situation is you learn how to give that gift so you can get the reciprocity. You've got to first invest in that ability to move forward. So we covered a little bit last time about gratitude and oh, um, advocate and awarenesses, IQ and EQ. There's our start. But I want to transition into this backstory um, about how to transition from first half of life to second half of life. And I remember this would be two or three weeks ago. I'm sitting at home. We were in our sacred hour and I was doing some reading and writing and contemplating and I was, it was for two days I had this, it wasn't a melancholy one. What's that place between being heavy but being pretty excited because I'm learning something? I know what it is. I was in that wrestling mode. Like um, I'm wrestling with a thought. I'm wrestling mm -hmm. with a concept. I'm mm -hmm. wrestling with a new awareness, <clears throat> right? That's yeah. what was happening to me. I was wrestling. That's what I think mindfulness is that's what i think prayer is that's what i think when you share energy you're wrestling you're trying to get this anyway so let me read just a, a little bit about this this uh process i was going through and i know sherry you've you've thought a little bit about what i've written here so here's what i wrote there are times in life where the world seems to hit pause and the reflection button is pushed time stands still and questions rain down like golf balls from heaven each question finds a new spot in my mind and my body to connect. Bruised and broken, I attempt to make sense of the questions and find relief in the wisdom of sages, prophets, and in principles that guide my seemingly feeble resolve to be the best I can be. Answers give me temporary relief. With time, these answers inspire hope that the pain will mitigate, that my answers will become a healing balm that balances my frustration in life and strengthens my determination to continue the fight. In my first half of life, I found energy looking for solutions outside of me. Family, church, leaders, government, organizations, strangers, and books. Of those mentioned, my, my greatest respite came from books. There is something about reading a well-crafted sentence that drives a principle to the heart and plants a growing seed of strength. Second to my books were words on life that were shared for principle's sake and not because I was out of order or needed to be right. Now, I don't know if that came off clear. When I hear someone speak eloquently, well thought out as an invitation to learn something, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm present. Mm -hmm. But when someone speaks from a holier than thou position, telling me what I have to do, challenging me in your face type thing. Yeah. I don't get that message. It, the energy yeah. itself just hits a, a wall, right? So it's a principle-based message, message versus a personality-based message. Oh, wow. I'm going to write that down. Make a note of that. That's really good. Contrasting my books and principle-based sermons were the countless words of counsel given in environments shrouded with guilt and shooting. Such marked my first half of life. Despite a lifetime of searching, the most profound experiences were within the confines of my being and not from the outside in. Now, can you unzip that a little bit? Like, how is it that these profound experiences were coming from the inside of you, not the outside of you? 